tonight. North fortified. North Korea announces complete severance of roads and railways to South Korea. Milton cautions. A million people were ordered to evacuate from the path of Category 4 Hurricane Milton. Heightened risk. MI5 chief warns UK is facing growing threat of plot after plot from Iran. Russian intelligence agencies are also on a sustained mission. And taking a swim. Moose rescued in Bedford, New Hampshire after getting stuck under cover of a ground pool. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight where we bring you the latest updates across the world for this Tuesday and we begin today in North Korea. North Korea will cut off road and railway access to South Korea from today onwards in a bid to completely separate the two countries. Its military said the North would permanently shut off and block the southern border to fortify areas on its side. According to the General Staff of the Korean People's Army, the move is a self-defense measure to deter war and protect the North's security from its primary enemy, referring to the South. It's also believed to be a response to South Korean military exercises and visits by U.S. strategic nuclear assets to the region. The North said it notified the U.S. military about the fortification project in a telephone message on Wednesday morning to prevent any misjudgment and accidental conflict. Also on Wednesday, Soros Joint Chief of Staff warned against unilateral action to change current conditions, saying all responsibility lies with Pyongyang. Over in Singapore, a Spanish couple on their honeymoon in Singapore have been detained after protesting against the Singaporean owner of the football club they support. Singapore has some of the world's strictest laws on public assembly, which includes assemblies even of one person. Danny Caseta posted photographs of himself outside the home of Peter Lim, the billionaire owner of Valencia CF, holding a banner criticizing the business magnate. Mr. Caseta and his partner Mireya Sayers were stopped while trying to leave Singapore airport on Friday and had their passports confiscated. Valencia Mayor Maria Jose Catala told Spanish radio station on Cero. It is unclear what charges the pair face, if any, but the matter will be resolved later. The government says these laws are necessary to to maintain order and safety. In 2020, a Singaporean activist who had long campaigned for freedom of speech was arrested for posting with a placard with a smiley face. Shortly after arriving in Singapore on Thursday, Mr. Caseta posted on X that he would take some photos with his lovely flag, which reads, Lim Go Home. Mr. Lim is deeply unpopular with Valencia fans who have seen their club's fortunes decline significantly over the course of his 10-year tenure. Encouraged by users online, Mr. Coseta posted a series of photos of himself at various tourist spots in Singapore holding the yellow banner. Another image shows him outside what is believed to be the luxury complex where Mr. Lim lives in Singapore. A video he posted shows Mr. Coseta placing a yellow sticker reading Lim Out, a common sight in the city of Valencia on the residence gate. The images quickly went viral among Valencia fans and Mr. Coseta even gave an interview to Valencia Football Podcast on Thursday. He explained that as soon as his wife suggested going to Singapore and Bali, he had a light bulb moment and decided to bring some stickers and a banner. Kenyan MPs are due to vote on whether to impeach Deputy President Rigati Gachagua in a political row that has crippled the nation following his recent fallout with President William Ruto. Kenyan MPs have voted overwhelmingly in favour of removing the country's deputy president over accusations of corruption. Lawmakers also accuse Rigati Gachagua of practising ethically divisive politics and undermining the government. Gachagua denies any wrongdoing in a row that follows his recent fallout with President William Ruto. Yesterday evening, Speaker Moses Vetengwala announced that 281 MPs have adopted an 11-charge impeachment motion, with 44 MPs voting against and one abstaining. He is accused of acquiring properties through corrupt means. The vice president, who is a wealthy businessman, said most of the houses and land belong to his late brother's estate. However, many Kenyan MPs took to the parliamentary floor to tarnish his reputation and to show they were on President Ruto's side in this row at the top of government. 
The political drama has taken the focus off demands of the largely disgruntled Kenyan public as they struggle to cope with the high cost of living. The 59-year-old politician, popularly known as Rigi G, has described allegations against him as outrageous and sheer propaganda. Political tensions have been running high in the East African country since June when deadly demonstrations erupted over unpopular tax hikes, exposing a deep rift between Ruto and Gachagua. Ruto sacked most of his cabinet and brought in members of the main opposition following the anti-tax protests, in which more than 50 people were killed. Several MPs aligned to Gachagua were summoned by police last month, accused of funding the protests, though no charges were brought. Ahead of the vote, security was heightened in the capital Nairobi with police patrols and major roads leading to parliament blocked to the public. About 20 lawyers were hired to defend Gachagua against the impeachment motion and a total of 291 MPs more than the 117 required by the Constitution, signed the motion to initiate the impeachment process last week. On a diplomatic update now, Britain's Foreign Secretary David Lamy will visit China next week. His visit is planned as the new Labour government seeks less confrontation or ties with the world's second largest economy and to resume trade and investment talks. British officials have said that they want to recalibrate many of the previous Conservative Party-led government's positions on China, which are described as an epoch-defining challenge, particularly around accepting Chinese job-creating investment. But Britain is unlikely to budge on issues such as Chinese firms' involvement in providing key infrastructure, human rights and restoring the license of state broadcaster CGTN, as it is controlled by China's ruling Communist Party. Lamy, who has vowed to overhaul Britain's ties with China, will meet Chinese officials in Beijing and representatives of British firms in Shanghai. His initiative has not yet been finalised, but however, another person familiar with this planning said. A foreign office spokesperson said ministerial travel would be announced in the usual way. China's foreign ministry said it could not offer any information on the visit, but added that it hoped to work with the UK on the basis of mutual respect and win-win cooperation. During a telephone call in August, British Prime Minister Keir Starmer, who took office on the previous month, told Chinese President Xi Jinping their countries must be able to talk frankly about disagreements while pursuing close economic ties and cooperation on global issues. British Finance Minister Rachel Reeves is also considering travelling to China in the near future. Her visit will aim to revive trade and investment talks that are supposed to take place annually. The last round of UK-China economic and financial dialogue, as it is called, was held in 2019. British government figures show that China is Britain's sixth largest trading partner, accounting for 5% of total trade. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Still in the US, Hurricane Milton is expected to make landfall overnight with Tampa in its path and Tampa Bay is forecast to face a record-breaking storm surge of 10 to 15 feet. This morning, Vice President Kamala Harris slamming Donald Trump, calling him irresponsible for spreading false claims and conspiracy theories about the federal disaster response. Harris calling out Trump for repeatedly and falsely claiming that the federal government is spending FEMA relief money on migrants instead of storm survivors. But FEMA's disaster relief funds are separate from other Homeland Security Department programs, including those that support migrant response. It's extraordinarily irresponsible. It's about him. It's not about you. And the reality is that FEMA has so many resources that are available to folks who desperately need them now and resources that are about helping people get back on their feet and rebuild and have places to go. You are entitled to these resources. People are entitled to these resources. And it is critically important that people apply for the help that is there to support. Trump has repeatedly brought politics into disaster relief. Overnight on Fox News, the former president again attacking the Biden-Harris administration and wrongly claiming hurricane victims can only access $750 each. FEMA says that's false and that these conspiracy theories could keep aid from getting to the people who need it most.
Italy and US, Hurricane Milton is expected to make landfall overnight with Tampa in its path. And Tampa Bay is forecast to face a record-breaking storm surge of 10 to 15 feet. Tonight, mandatory evacuations on both coasts of Florida. Highways jammed. Millions heeding the calls to get out of Hurricane Milton's path before it's too late. Tampa's airport already deserted. Orlando's packed, set to close tomorrow. Authorities filling Tropicana Field with cots, a base camp for first responders. Governor DeSantis mobilizing some 8,000 National Guard troops. The monster hurricane strengthening back into a Category 5 in the Gulf. Hurricane hunters jolted by extreme turbulence as they flew into Milton's eye wall. A storm taking aim at the Tampa metro area, home to more than 3 million people, and hasn't seen a direct hit from a major hurricane in more than 100 years. Tampa General Hospital, which treats the area's most critical patients, will remain operational, hoping the aqua fence they used to keep the surge away during Helene will also hold up against Milton. Updating you on the conflicts in the Middle East, Israeli's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says his defense forces have killed the latest successor of Hamas's former leader, who was recently killed in one of its strikes. These explosions seen in Beirut on October 4th are believed to be the area where Sviadin was located. Lebanese sources have said Hezbollah had lost contact of the reported successor following recent airstrikes. Israel continued with its offensive with a barrage of airstrikes into southern Beirut today and says its ground forces have made gains in the southern portion of Lebanon. Meanwhile, Hezbollah's now acting leader says the group is supporting efforts to broker a ceasefire deal with Israel. The U.S. responded today, believing that Hezbollah appears to be on the defensive. Hezbollah previously, previously stated that it would only consider a ceasefire once a truce with Hamas was in place. However, this time, the terrorist group's acting leader didn't mention Hamas in his recent speech. Meanwhile, the conflict spread to the North African country of Tunisia, where Palestinian supporters brawled with the police. Clashes erupted in the capital city of Tunis, where protesters launched fireworks and attempted to reach the French embassy. However, security forces used prepper spray to disperse the agitated crowd in Tunis, Tunisia. People gathered in large numbers on the streets, chanting slogans with placards and Palestinian flags. Israelis marked the first anniversary of the Hamas attacks with ceremonies and protests on the 7th of October. Hamas-led militants killed about 1,200 people and took approximately 250 hostages hostages back to Gaza. It responded with a military campaign to topple the Hamas regime in the Gaza Strip, destroy the terrorist group and free the hostages. Director General of MI5 Kane McCallum gave a speech on the current threat level in the UK following escalation in the Middle East where he outlined the challenges of MI5 is currently facing. The Director General of the UK Security Service MI5, Ken McCallum, warned of the dangers posed by Russia and Iran, as well as growing concern about Al-Qaeda and Islamic State in his annual update on the threats faced by Britain yesterday. McCallum said since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, more than 750 Russian diplomats had been expelled from Europe, with a great majority of them being spies. He said that this had dented the Russian intelligence service's capability and that this position was being maintained by denying diplomatic visas to those people Britain and allies considered Russian spies. He added, kick them out, keep them out. Instead, Russian state actors had turned to proxies including private intelligence operatives and criminals from Britain and other countries to do their dirty work. But this has diminished the professionalism of their operations and made them easier to disrupt. Since January of 2022, MI5 and British police had responded to 20 Iran-backed plots presenting potentially lethal threats to British citizens and UK residents. McCallum added that since the death of Masa Amini in Iranian police custody in September of 2022, there had been plot after plot. He said that like Russia, Iran was also using criminal proxies from drug traffickers to low-level crooks. The MI5 chief further added, saying that China still remained a significant risk, particularly in its threat to obtaining sensitive information from businesses and academia. However, he said China was different, and because of Britain's multi-layered complex relationship with Beijing, it required a more nuanced approach. The UK-China economic relationship supports UK growth, which underpins security, and there are also risks to be managed, he said. The choices are complex, and it rightly falls to ministers to make the big strategic judgments on 
relationships with China. Kyiv said that its forces had struck a large oil terminal overnight on the occupied Crimean Peninsula, while Moscow claimed the capture of another village in East Ukraine. Ukraine also said at least five civilians were killed by Russian attacks, including in a strike on a civilian ship in the port of Odessa, as well as in the east and the south of the country. Fire and smoke billow from the Mian oil terminal in Crimea. Ukrainian forces have just struck the facility on the Russian-occupied peninsula in Fedosia. In recent months, Kyiv has increased attacks on such sites. It's in an attempt to starve Russian troops of fuel. In eastern Ukraine, Moscow has steadily been gaining ground in the Donetsk region. Late on Monday night, Ukraine's military confirmed Russian troops entered the outskirts of Turetsk. They said the situation was unstable. It is around 90 kilometers from the city of Pokrovsk, a crucial logistics and supply hub for the Ukrainian army. It includes major roads and a railway station. Moscow is also continuing its bombings in other cities, such as Kherson and Kyiv. Ukrainian experts predict an intensification of Russian strikes against the country's power grid as winter looms. The Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, indicated that he would go to the Ukrainian Defence Summit on the 12th of October in Ramstein, Germany. President Zelensky wants to present concrete measures with a view to a just end to the war. Ukraine has also been insisting for months to obtain approval from its allies to strike Russian territory in depth. But the United States remains opposed to it for fear of an escalation with Moscow. Mexico's new government presented its plan to combat violence and crime, vowing to strengthen the police and force boosting intelligence as the country mourned the slain mayor of Chilpancingo, the latest victim of the high-profile gang violence. In this crowded church in southwestern Mexico, people gathered to say goodbye to a mayor who was brutally murdered six days after taking office. The death of Chilpancingo mayor Alejandro Arcos has left the country reeling. It's the latest case of high-profile violence in Mexico, which also includes an intra-cartel war further north in Sinaloa that has left scores of people dead. Against that backdrop on Tuesday, Mexico's new government unveiled its plan to combat violence and crime. Nosotros what are we going to use? Prevención, prevention, attention to causes, intelligence, y presencia. and presence, said Mexican President Claudia Sheinbaum, who just recently took office. Her government is vowing to strengthen the National Guard police force in an attempt to reduce murders, kidnappings, and extortion, and boost intelligence gathering with a focus on addressing causes of crime and improving coordination between institutions. Shane Baum said a war against the cartels, like the bloody crackdown launched in 2006, would not return. Meanwhile, at the same press conference, Security Minister Omar Garcia Harfuch revealed new details about Arcos's killing. Photos had circulated on WhatsApp and in Mexican media on Sunday, depicting a severed head on top of a pickup truck, appearing to be that of Arcos. We know he was going to a specific meeting. He went alone, he said on Tuesday. That meeting was out of town, the minister added, who said Arcos had not asked for federal security protection. One newspaper, citing government sources, reported that Arcos had met with members of a criminal group hours before his death. Mexico is exceptionally deadly for political candidates and officials. They're routinely targeted by organized crime. TikTok faces new lawsuits filed by the 13 U.S. states and the District of Columbia accusing the popular social media platform of harming and failing to protect young people. New lawsuits filed against TikTok on Tuesday accuse the popular social media platform of harming and failing to protect young people. The lawsuits were filed separately in New York, California, the District of Columbia, and 11 other states. They expand Chinese-owned TikTok's legal fight with U.S. regulators and seek new financial penalties against the company. The states accuse TikTok of using intentionally addictive software designed to keep children watching as long and often as possible and misrepresenting its content moderation effectiveness. They also argue that TikTok seeks to maximize the amount of time users spend on the app to target them with ads. 
Washington, D.C.'s Attorney General alleged TikTok operates an unlicensed money transmission business through its live streaming and virtual currency features. TikTok said it strongly disagreed with the claims, quote, many of which we believe to be inaccurate and misleading. TikTok provides safety features including default screen time limits and privacy defaults for minors under 16, the company said. The U.S. Justice Department sued TikTok in August for allegedly failing to protect children's privacy on the app. Other states previously sued TikTok for failing to protect children from harm, including Utah and Texas. TikTok on Monday rejected the allegations in a court filing. TikTok's Chinese parent company ByteDance is battling a U.S. law that could ban the app in the United States. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. And finally tonight, the police and fire department of Bedford, New Hampshire, came into action when a moose found itself in a bit of distress during its afternoon swim. Nothing to see here, just a moose taking a dip. The Bedford, New Hampshire police and fire department were both called out when a moose got stuck during his afternoon swim. They pulled the pool cover back so the animal could get out which he calmly did while giving the camera some side-eye. Because the moose seemed unharmed and non-threatening, officers let him go. Moose can grow to be six feet tall, and they can weigh up to 1,600 pounds, according to the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Their antlers can be 50 or more inches wide. Chief Duty says that because of their size, moose can be very dangerous. So it's always best for residents to call them instead of dealing with wildlife themselves. And that brings us to the end of today's bulletin. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. Stay tuned as we've got Sanavi Mundan Naika joining you next on Nike Business Report. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.